You are listening to the Lifeblood Podcast, a podcast about the totally average, unremarkable little town of Bright Ridge, where there is definitely nothing strange going on. This is Chapter 2. Mr. Elwood's office, please hold. Mr. Elwood's office, please hold. Mr. Elwood's... Oh, hi, Lisa. How are you? Oh, I'm great. Thanks for asking. How's Rich? I'll tell you something, folks. It'll be a cold day in hell when I get a quiet day in the office. Huh? (laughs) Yeah, that's right. I'm talking to you. What? You thought your little bumpkin protagonist was the only screwball out there who can narrate? Damn, I'm surrounded by morons. Let me make this nice and simple for you to understand. While Mr. Small Town Hero is off playing investigative journalist, the real movers and shakers of this town, namely me, we're getting some actual work done. I don't even know why I'm talking here. I mean, this is just kind of pointless. I mean, it's just, I'm the only one that does anything. God damn it, where's my cigarettes at? All right, all right. And now I'm stuck here fielding 10,000 emails and two dozen phone calls a minute all because a couple of moronic teeny boppers had to go in for the love of... <clears throat> what? What do you want? Who's this? Have the runaway been located? Located? Oh, is that what I'm supposed to be doing? Silly me, I've been out here singing Yankee Doodle all morning with my thumb rammed up my ass. You forget yourself, Elwood. <clears throat> yes, right, sorry. Uh, just, yes. Y- yes, I have. Where are they? I believe they were brought into the local police station for questioning. It couldn't be helped, but I sent Masterson in to start on damage control. The man's a buffoon. Just like the rest of this county's population. He's good with townies. And a reminder that EOS graduates can and do become well-adjusted, contributing members of society. Not to some degree, anyways. I'll remind you, Elwood. This experiment was begun at your insistence. Anything that comes of it, including any financial gains or expenses or blemishes to the company's reputation, will be considered Right, of course. Thank you for the reminder. Good day, Elwood. Son of a bitch. When it rains, it pours. Stephanie, get Masterson on the line. I need to speak to that imbecile. Yes, Mr. Elwood. The trouble with shareholders is that they collectively have a memory capacity of a single benzo-addled concussed goldfish. I'm having some trouble hearing you. Sure. They want to lynch me for this mess, but they forget that I'm the one who launched this branch. The New Horizon Center. And every cent that the company has ever made from it in the last 15 years is thanks almost exclusively to me. Now, I'm a very humble man, but I'm also a goddamn financial genius. And I've got a nose for business that could outsniff a bloodhound. And if these latest initiatives I'm looking into are even half as profitable as the center's adolescent wars have been, then I deserve a damn medal. Not getting my ass chewed out by the board of directors, He's and I. Three, sir. Huh? Oh, yes. Thank you, Stephanie. Now, where was I? Masterson, you there? Sure am. Man, you are psychic. I was just about to call you. Uh Uh-huh. Is that so? That it is. Listen, uh, the situation in McGuire's taken care of. You're welcome. I told the owner we'd have some flunkies come out and clean the place up for him. Should be plenty of time to sweep for any, uh, undesirable odds and ends the kitties might have left behind. Hmm, that's not bad. Well done, Mr. Masterson. I must admit, you're smarter than you look. That's unfortunate for you. Yeah, tell me about it. Anyway, about the kids. Uh, they got some kind of therapist or whatever from the school going with them down to the station. Her name's Jackie Adler. What? And you didn't tell them that was unnecessary? An EOS representative will be there to see to their legal needs. Of course I told them that, man. But you know how it goes with these bleeding heart types. They want to make sure you as orange is seeing the company interests. So the gal's got to be there, making sure their rights don't get trampled. I see. Very well. Anything else? Well, sort of. Out with the Masterson. So, there's a slight wrinkle. This counselor, social worker, well, she knows one of the kids. And Dex Kennedy was a student at the high school where she works. That's hardly uncommon. Most of the patients at the center come from this or one of the neighboring townships. Yeah, 
blah, 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 boho me, that sort of thing. I see. Hmm. So, uh, what do you want to do? Leave it to me, Masterson. I'll take it from here. Sure thing, boss man. <sighs> hmm. Sounds like it's time to start calling in some favors. Huh? Oh. What are you still doing here? Can't you see I've got some important business to take care of? Go on. Scram! with maybe some rain to the south-southeast. A winter storm watch has begun further north, and we're looking at a possible winter alert ourselves over the next few hours. Our snowcast over the weekend is looking like snow and ice, possibly upwards of three inches of accumulation. I... I can't remember what happened. Everything feels like a blur since my parents pulled me out of school. I remember the looks on their faces the night I told them everything. I talked about the research I'd been doing online and some of the things we'd been taught about in our wellness class this year, and the conversations I'd had with Miss Hadler. They hadn't yelled or screamed at me like I thought they might. Dad didn't say anything, in fact. And Mom, she... Well, it was almost worse than her yelling. She just kept saying how scared she was for me, how worried she was that I was about to make a decision I'd regret. And then they'd each sort of gotten distant, or more distant than they always were anyway. For weeks, it was like no one in the house would even look at me. Then I came home from school on Friday and saw the luggage in the living room. I asked where they were going, and they told me it wasn't them going anywhere. I, I wish I could remember what happened. I stared at my hands. They were all cut up and bandaged. Officer Peterson had been very nice when he got out of his car and went into the station. He helped me clean up all the cuts and took me to his desk to put a few bandits on the really bad ones. He even took my handcuffs off. There we go, kiddo. Good as new. Uh, thank you, officer. Call me Phil. He leaned back in his chair and crossed his arms. For a couple of seconds, he just stared at me. You know, you probably don't remember me, but we met before. We did? Yeah, about a year and a half ago. I... oh. Yeah, I was one of the officers dispatched when you're... I don't know, I guess it was your brother? Half-brother. Right. Right. When he... Well, I won't go opening up old wounds, but I remember you. You didn't seem like the bad type to me then, and you still don't now. Thank you. What happened to you last night, kid? Did that boy pressure you into breaking in there or something? I don't... I, I, I can't. Officer Peterson, I'm sorry, but we really can't have you questioning Dax until their guardian or lawyer arrives. Miss Adler walked over to us. I looked up and she gave me a small smile. She looked tired and sad. And not just the kind of tired and sad that everybody said women look like when they weren't wearing makeup and smiling. I was used to adults looking at me like that. She'd ridden up front in the passenger seat of the patrol car when Officer Peterson drove us all to the station, but had stopped outside to talk to the couple of reporters who were waiting out front. Bright Ridge was a small town, and there was never a whole lot going on. I bet every kid at school was going to be talking about this. About me... Again. I wasn't questioning her. We were just chatting. Ain't that right, Dax? Phil? <sighs> All right. All right. Sure, I get it. How about you come over here with me, Dax? Okay. You take care, kid. Um, thank you, uh, Phil. You must be hungry. When was the last time you ate? I... I don't remember. But I'm not very hungry. Maybe just some water then. Okay. Come on, come on, come on, come on. 
I stood in line at the grocery store, anxiously tapping my foot while trying to look up how long AAA batteries last for in old lecture recorders. Of course, the public Wi-Fi at the strip mall was as overburdened as a public defender's office on the Monday morning after Halloween, so I wasn't getting anything. In aggravation, I stuffed my phone back in my pocket and tried not to glare at the woman ahead of me in line, who seemed to be having trouble getting her rewards card to scan. Jeez, Christ lady. Excuse me? Uh, nothing. Nothing. Uh, sorry. Thank you for your patronage. Have a wonderful rest of your day. As I started unloading my cart onto the conveyor belt with the sort of rushed excitability a child had on a Christmas morning, the cashier girl began scanning the items with all the passion of a reanimated corpse. No, seriously. You might think your hometown has it bad when it comes to vacant-eyed teen cashiers, but you've got nothing on our award-winning customer service standards here in Brightridge. Of course, the awards were for worst possible service, but we left that part out of the brochures. You could always tell when someone was a recent EOS graduate. They had these hollowed-out, lifeless expressions on their faces, with heavy bags under their eyes and pale skin that almost seemed to glow under the cheap fluorescent lighting. Damn. I thought as I watched the total climb higher and higher with each item the girl lethargically scanned. Maybe this was the universe's way of punishing me for taking advantage of a friend. Most nights, I just ate something at McGuire's, which thankfully Sean never charged me for or took out of my pay. And on nights I was off, I was something of a TV dinner connoisseur. Stouffer's, DiGiorno, Hungry Man, Banquet, you name it, I'd seen them all. I once considered starting a blog where I rated and reviewed them, but figured it'd be too depressing. And rather than knocking back a bottle of Motrin, just abandoned the idea altogether. Two twenty four seventy five. Christ. Forgot how expensive a good meal actually costs. The cashier had no response. Just stared at me vacantly as I took out my credit card and scanned it, praying it wouldn't get denied, because wouldn't that just figure? I'd have to do a little rebudgeting to make sure I could pay my rent on time this month, but it wouldn't kill me. Anyway, at least it would be nice to eat something that wasn't microwaved for once. Not to mention spend some time with Jackie, of course. Reconnected when she'd moved back to Bright Ridge to get her master's, but once she started working three jobs, we'd fallen off each other's radars for a while. As I loaded my bags back into my cart, I looked at the cashier. How long ago were you at the center? What? Eos. You were there, right? Yeah. How long ago? She shrugged. Great. That's helpful. Just take a guess. Hmm. Well, a few months ago, maybe. What was it like? Boring. What did you do? Hey, pal, this ain't a singles bar. She's like 10 years too young for you anyway. Keep it moving. What? No, I wasn't... Ah, never mind. Thank you for your patronage. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Yeah, I can tell. You really mean it, too. Such conversationalists. How do they do it? Jeez, what? Can you throw in a little emotion into it? I mean, come on. Minimum wage isn't that bad. I mean, it's pretty bad, but... Uh, you know, you're right. You have, yeah, you should probably just be like this, honestly. Uh, toodles. I'm going to let you in on a secret. No matter how much a system will try to protect certain assets, there's always a part that's poorly fortified. Take children, for example. You might think, given how they're the future and all, that they would almost be universally difficult for unsavory characters to get a hold of. More trouble than they'd be worth, you might say. And you'd be right, to a certain extent. It's why Child Protective Services exist. It's why FBI background checks and certifications are required to work with them as teachers, counselors, tutors, and the like. But if you find an industry that isn't taken seriously, that no one wants to bother thinking about long enough to properly regulate, that you're in. Which is why, technically, EOS Behavior is a life coaching facility. Now, of course, there's still some additional headache when you go involving minors in your corporate level get rich quick scheme, but grease the right palms and kiss the right babies, and the world is yours. Just the same, it's always good business practice to diversify, diversify, diversify. Good afternoon, Mr. Elwood. Oh, excuse me for a moment. Hmm, yes, good afternoon. You wouldn't happen to know where Dr. Freeman is, would you? Hmm. I believe at this time of day she would be in the main compound, supervising the bleeding. Ah, yes, of course, thank you. My pleasure. As you are. Are you 
As I was saying, children can make the life of an illegitimate business very difficult. For one of two reasons. Reason one is the government oversight, as we just discussed. Reason two is the people that you have to hire who actually want to work with the little buggers. Those people, by and large, have good hearts. They're empathetic, loving, morally upstanding, and care about the future of this great nation. It makes me sick. However, as an elementary schooler can tell you, there are two varieties of child care professionals, the underachievers and the nitwits. The underachievers are a kind whose mommies and daddies paid for their child to get their undergraduate education at a party school, and the teaching degree was the easiest to pass while hungover from the ragers the night before. And the nitwits are the brainless airheads who spent too much time during their old educational experience huffing glue in the back of the class or smoking pot in the restrooms to have mentally evolved much past the age of their charges. The blind leading the blind, as it were. Those are the type of professionals who we hire at EOS. People who don't care enough or are too stupid to ask questions. Who are happy just to get a paycheck and babysit a group of shit-brained teens for a week during their second half of their treatment here at New Horizons. Teaching a few bullshit skill classes before kicking them to the curb, back to the parents' waiting arms and starting all over again with the next round of cattle freshly rotated in. Rinse and repeat on mass. It's a beautiful thing. Here, take a look at this one, for example. Anger. Show of hands, who here has ever felt angry before? Mm -hmm. I guess. Yeah. yeah. Right. We all have at some point or another. And who can tell me if anger is normal or not? Come on. Anybody? Anybody just shout it out. Uh, no? Correct. Anger is a terrible, horrible, useless emotion that only terrible, horrible, useless people feel. So, when we're feeling angry, what should we do instead? Anybody? Um, not feel that way? Very good. That's exactly right. When you feel yourself starting to get angry, the best thing to do is to shut down immediately. And whatever you do, never ever tell somebody else that you're feeling angry. Because if you do, say it with me class, everyone, everyone will hate, hate you and, you you'll, and never you'll never be loved. be loved. Very good. Oh, yes, in the back. You have a question? Uh, yeah. What do you do if you, like, can't make yourself shut down and the anger doesn't stop? Oh, that's a very good question. Class, does anybody have any ideas for your classmate here who sounds like an absolutely awful human being with no redeeming qualities whatsoever? Does anybody have any recommendations for this useless, abominable... Oh, yes, up front. Go ahead. Maybe they could just feel something else instead? Very good. That is an excellent suggestion. When we are feeling angry, we can try feeling something else instead. Marvelous, wonderful, fantastic job, class. You're all doing so well. I am so proud of... Oh, Mr. Elwood. I'm sorry I didn't see you there. Class, say hello to Mr. Elwood. Hello, hello Mr. Mr. Elwood. Can we help you with something, sir? No, no. J just checking in on the operation. Carry on. Very good. Okay, class. That brings us to our next subject. Grief. Some of you might say that your anger only started showing up after you lost someone or something important to you. But remember, that is a miserable excuse. And you should, under no circumstances, feel that grief validates or normalizes your anger. As I was saying, that wing is primarily for the second half of our patented two-week program. Anytime some regulating body shows up at our door for a surprise inspection, that's where they're shown around. But, and this might surprise you, that's not where the real magic is made. No, our real secret is week one. And we keep inspecting bodies far away from that part of campus. Follow me, please. Please, I'll be 
good. No, you can't. Let me, let me go. Stop struggling, me... please. I'm We've not... been over no. this. Struggling only makes it take longer. <laughs> Don't take me back there tonight. I don't want to go back there tonight. Whining. Always the one. When has whining ever gotten you anywhere? Any time before? Uh, <sighs> I just love the sights and sounds of unscrupulous financial success. Okay, that should do it for the seasoning. A bit of lemon, check. Now let's see about those potatoes. Everything was coming together beautifully for tonight. Of course, Dad was going to kill me when he saw I'd unpacked half the kitchen. That's not to say it was an elaborate meal I was making. On the contrary, in fact. But after we lost Mom, neither me or my dad were much in the way of chefs. Still, I could make a serviceable pan-seared steak, and it probably, maybe, hopefully, wouldn't even give either of us food poisoning. Hang on. Just a sec. Hello? Hey, Harry. Jackie! Hey! Perfect timing. You done at the station? Uh, I'm what? Oh, uh, no, no, no. Uh, you've you've got to come right over. What? Yeah, the food's going to get cold if you stop at home first. But I... Sorry, I uh, I didn't realize how long you were going to take the precinct. Harry. I know, I know, I'm sorry. I should have asked first or texted you or something. You are still coming over though, right? Awesome. Fine. Yeah. Of course. That's no problem. You said you're at your parents' place? Yeah. You need the address? No. I remember. See you soon. You too. Bye. Phew. That was close. If Jackie had stopped at home first, there was no way she was going to keep that enormous work bag with her to come to mind. And then I'd never get to the bottom of all this. I still might not. What time even is... Oh, shoot. I was going to have to double time it if I wanted to make sure dinner was ready by the time she got here. Where did I put the garlic and rosemary? God damn it! Dr. Freeman! Dr. Freeman! Not quite. Son of a... <clears throat> Dr. Luther, you, uh... You startled me. Come to see our lovely patron, have you? Not nah, precisely. Dr. Luther was a brilliant beanstalk of a man, who, despite a perfectly polite presentation unwavering loyalty to the project, never failed to give off a distinct impression that he would like nothing more than to strap you down to an operating table, dissect you alive, and then taxidermy your corpse to dress up in demeaning wardrobe to place in impolite poses around his home. I've never been to the man's house personally, despite numerous, slightly too friendly invitations, so I, I could not say for certain if this was or wasn't, in fact, a hobby of his. It did not help his reputation that his supervisors kept going missing under increasingly suspicious circumstances. Luther was technically the senior most member of the RD department at EOS, but given his utterly sociopathic nature and the general sense everyone got while in his presence that their body was suddenly covered in live insects, Dr. Freeman was brought on board about six years back to supervise the department and report back to both myself and the partners. She somehow managed to befriend the deranged doctor, something none of her predecessors could manage, and had, as a result, outlasted all the New Horizon previous chief science officers by a whopping 71 months and counting. That woman was a godsend. Or, well, Whatever a morally bankrupt version of a godsend would be called. 
I was told Dr. Freeman would be here. I need to speak with her. Oh, I'm afraid that's hardly possible. She's quite busy supervising the bleeding. Still? Ah, yes, I suppose. You are welcome to wait and observe from the observation deck if you'd like. He said, pointing me toward a door on the left of the tiny lab before returning to his work where he peered through a microscope with the enthusiasm of a leecherous teenage boy at his first peep show. Now, to be frank, I'm really more of a big picture type. The ins and outs of the center's day-to-day -day affairs are something I generally don't indulge in. A good leader knows how to delegate, after all. That and when it comes to the bleeding, I'm, eh, well, it's just kind of gross. Incredibly gross, as a point of fact. Hmm. But I did need to talk to Dr. Freeman, so I went over to the side door, took a hold of the knob, took a few deep breaths to study myself, and stepped in. I stepped up to the reinforced glass and pressed one of the two small buttons on the side wall, making an active effort not to look down at the scene below in the process. The sounds of the operating theater were fed through the sound system, which crackled and sputtered something hideous. And keep an eye on the blood pressure and heart rate. We have some odd readings yesterday afternoon. Yes, Doctor. Good, good. <laughs> and good afternoon, Frank. I'm surprised to see you here. Come for a science lesson, have we? I'm afraid it's a little more complicated than a frog, this. But I do commend your enthusiasm. I reached out and touched the second button on the small panel. Dr. Freeman, good afternoon. I take it this isn't a social call? I'm afraid not. A pity. Well, we were just about done here. I'll join you shortly. Very good. I switched the intercom system back off and went back into the small lab adjoining the observation deck, where Luther and company just slightly went out as a preferable of the two possible stimuli to be subjected to while awaiting an audience with Dr. Freeman. I busied myself checking emails and avoiding answering Dr. Luther's numerous inquiries as to my hobbies, interests, or likelihood to be lost while out hiking without having told any loved ones my whereabouts. Eventually, I heard the door leading in from the operating theater open up, and looked up and saw Dr. Freeman stepping through. What a pleasant surprise! I can count the number of times you visited the main lab on one hand. To what do I owe the pleasure? You've heard about the incident in town? Naturally. So the procedure was a failure, I take it? That remains to be seen. How's that? Dr. Freeman put her hands behind her back and paced the room with an almost wistful elegance as she considered the question. It was like watching storm clouds gather. Just because an experiment failed to disprove its null hypothesis does not make it a failure. Isn't that the literal definition of an experiment family? You just used the word fail twice in the last sentence. Really? You should try not to be so narrow-minded, Frank. If every failure were only a failure and nothing more, <laughs> then there would be no successes in the world. I don't understand. Hmm, no, of course you don't. Let me see. Failure is inevitable, yes? I mean, on some level, we all agree to that, don't we? Be it while learning to walk or while solving a complicated mathematical proof or when learning to fly an airplane or tame lions. Though on those latter two, you're liable to perhaps only experience it once. But amidst all, mistakes are likely, if not outright necessary, to happen. Not all together, and certainly not all at once. Also, often not even by the same people. In fact, I wager that it'd be very unusual indeed to find somebody who's failed at all of them. Though, I suppose that with the right hereditary predisposition to risk-taking behaviors, it might align in such a way to actually increase one's chances to both attempt, and therefore possibly fail at both pilotry and lion taming. And then, of course, I've done all four. Though that's really besides the point, and I do wish you wouldn't go about sidetracking me. I didn't. Very good. Apology accepted. Now, as I was saying, success, on the other hand, very much unlike failure, is never a guarantee. Therefore, for an improbable thing to occur, or even just a thing that is not absolutely certain to happen, it follows that inevitable things would have had to have taken place at some point along its process. Do you understand now? With one glance at the look on my face, which was surely about as stupid as a shoe sale at a paraplegic convention, Dr. Freeman had her answer and scoffed in resignation. <sighs> We've been at this for how many years now? Six? Fifteen, I corrected. Happy to finally be contributing something of value to this conversation with any level of authority. As the basic concept of time was, thankfully, something with which I had at least a passing familiarity. 
You've been here six years, but the center has been here for 15, nearly 16 in fact. Yes, precisely. And yet in all that time, near nothing's changed. And we still hardly know anything more than we did when I first arrived. Despite heavens only knows how many things we've stuck under microscopes and stared at quizzically. Luther looked the smallest bit offended at that one, and clutched the head of his favorite microscope possessively. It was about time we got a little more proactive. These are just growing pains, you see. A necessary part of the scientific method. Look, I assume you're working to have the subjects collected and returned to us, yes? Of course. Then I imagine a thorough study of them each at the time will prove most enlightening. And we can move forward from there, adjusting our course accordingly. And that's assuming we're given an opportunity, I said, admittedly a bit self-pityingly. There's still an awful lot of damage control to be done. Ah, yes, right. Of course. Unfortunate. If I may. By all means, Dr. Luther. He turned to me with a wild excitement in his eyes. Exhibition of extreme strength and resistance to alcohol with increased impulsivity can all be easily explained away. All that's needed would be to have test results from the blood work or urine samples that will no doubt be collected at the precinct to come back positive for something once they might have been able to slip into the center upon their admission. Mm, alpha PVP, perhaps. What, like basalts? Flaka? The very same. Hmm, very interesting. Yes, you might be onto something there. Of course. Uh-huh. And Dr. Freeman, what are your thoughts about this? What in the... What in the hell? Ugh, it's that damned winter storm. Must have downed a transmission line further north towards the city. Is the source secure? Yes, ma'am. Is it stable? It appears so. Good. Get the backup power running from the hydrogen fuel cells. I need the operating theater powered up immediately. We cannot risk a breach in containment. Like you have to tell me. I'm the one down here with the thing. <sighs> I'm sorry to cut your visit short, Frank, but... No, no, I understand. Carry on. I'll keep you informed. Please do. <laughs> Dr. Freeman exited to go and help her assistant, leaving Luther and I in the power down lab. I moved toward the exit and was surprised when he didn't follow. Dr. Luther? Yes, Mr. Elwood. Are you... just gonna stand there? Why, yes, sir. The power is out, after all. And it would be quite ridiculous for me to attempt to work in the dark. Though, I thank you for asking. Well, yes, but could it... I mean... Uh, you, you know what? <laughs> Never mind. I'll, I'll, I'll leave you to your matters here. Very good, sir. Another unsettling detail about Dr. Luther was the fact that no one quite knew for certain what exactly he did at EOS, though he always went around doing it with such passion and dedication that it was simply taken for granted that it must have been important. So everyone just gave him a wide berth and left him to it, whatever it was. As I, too, was about to do precisely that, a thought occurred to me, and as much as it pained me to do so, I turned back around and asked, Luther? Yes? Who informed you of the details of McGuire's? Sir? The excessive drinking and extreme strength. I was only just made aware of those particulars myself. Oh, one hears things. The trees have ears and the fields have eyes, yes? Ah, I thought to myself. Never heard Luther use an idiom before. As I was about to inquire further, the lights around the lab came back on, and the computer monitors lit, though both duller than usual. It seems they were able to switch to the backup generators. Good. Yes, that's a relief. While not what you may have expected initially, there is promise to these reactions as well, wouldn't you agree? What, with the power? With the test subjects. How do you figure? The children. Their unusual behaviors in town. Uh, those changes are hardly useful in the upcoming efforts to expand with the adult wing. Then I invite you to expand your horizons, Mr. Elwood. No way, pun intended. Think of the benefits to such a serum. Especially should it prove true that the children have retained their base personalities. We're not doing pharmaceuticals. No, 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 of course not. But even just for internal or personal use, the possibilities would be near limitless. Hmm, interesting, interesting. Yes. Uh, Luther? Yes, Mr. Elwood. 
Could you um, have Dr. Freeman keep out a few vials worth of the... Uh... Eco, sir. Yes. And just have her get someone to deliver to in my office? Of course, sir. Thank you, Dr. Luther. Oh, it is my absolute pleasure, sir. There were those insects again. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to make a call. Sanford, there's been a um, development. I need you to do something for me. You're still at the police station, right? Good, good. Now listen carefully. You've been listening to Lifeblood, Chapter 2, an original audio series written, directed, and produced by Akiva Vita. Chapter 2 cast, featuring Steve Lloyd as Frank Elwood, Chris Rogers as Hugo Matthews, Kat Loveland as Jackie Adler, Devin Boer as Dax Kennedy, Thomas Mergianis as Dr. Luther, Hannah Flodo as Dr. Freeman, Ellie Chua as EOS teacher, Rico Brooks as Officer Phil Peterson, Sarah Jacklin as unknown speaker, Taya Barr as Stephanie, Joseph Boslinski as Jimmy Masterson, Michael Robinson as Newscaster 1, Loretta Chang as Newscaster 2, Star Lee as cashier, Aurea Mediocritus as woman shopper, Damon Sims as male shopper, Adam Robinson, Holly Harris, Gethin Hughes, and Lech Zorn as EOS employees, Tiana Scarson, Cecil Sykes, DK Universe, Minnie and Lumi Oaks as EOS students. Original theme music composed by Octavian. Additional credits available in the show notes. Lifeblood and all related characters are copyrighted 2023 and are the sole intellectual property of Akiva Vita. For more information on our show and its cast, visit us at lifebloodaudiodrama.wordpress.com. Thanks for listening. <laughs>